And I'm just one small farmer, uh, and but we made a, a, a pretty big impact. I mean, you, uh, it turned my world upside down. I'll just put it that way. The story of Craig Watts and Leah Garces this week on Upvoted by Rent. <laughs> Welcome to episode 13 of Upvoted by Red. I'm your host, Alexis O'Hanian. Last week, we talked to the one and only Don't Touch My Fucking Coffee. Mr. Coffee has an incredible story, and it embodies so much of what makes Reddit suck better. Well, he's a vacuum guy. Anyway, I'll be really excited to see what he can do with that customer car. There's a lot of cool things that came out of that episode, uh, not to mention some amazing art by our very own Young Luck, also known as Dante. Uh, he not only works at Reddit, but he's just a phenomenal artist. And his Game of Thrones take on last week's episode it needs to be seen. So if you haven't yet, check it out. It's over on upvoted.reddit.com. If you're not over there on our subreddit, why not? Why haven't you subscribed? You should. It's free, it's fun, and it's the way you let us know how we're doing. So thank you. Also, I'd like to take note that we've had some pretty controversial episodes recently uh, that have affected people in many different ways. We've told stories about abortion, homelessness, and even transgender issues. Now, our goal with Upvoted is not to push any agenda, but just to learn about these different facets of life for ourselves. We, I, none of us implore you to agree with every guest on this show, but just recognize that it's difficult to just be a person. It's hard to wake up every day and function as a human being, let alone face half the challenges so many of these people did. All we want to do is give them an opportunity to tell their stories. After all, that was basically what Reddit was all about. That's really, in large part, why we started it. All we want to do is give that platform using this podcast. And so no matter how many improvements we make with Upvoted every week, and believe me, we're paying attention to all that feedback and we keep improving, that aspect of the show will never change. So, along those lines, this week's episode is about meat. Well, specifically farming and the condition of the animals that we eat. Now, we've all heard methane from cows is responsible for 14% of greenhouse gases and about the concept of slaughterhouses. Now, I myself still enjoy eating meat, and I don't really ever plan to stop. But in the last few years, I've definitely thought a lot more than I ever did about how the meat I eat is raised. And a lot of this had to do with various things that I saw bubble up across the many different communities on Reddit. And one story in particular, uh, there was actually a video a couple of months ago from a chicken farmer named Craig Watts popped up on r slash videos. He put everything online when he invited Leah Garces from Compassion World Farming to record the conditions of his chicken factory farm. Keep in mind, his chicken were labeled as cage-free, but the video was horrifying. The original post garnered over 5,000 comments and Redders really started having discussion about factory farming, as well as what we need to do going forward. The two of them even continued the conversation. They joined Reddit two months ago for a rhythm AMA. So we're really fortunate to have both of them on the show to talk about this. Not just the video, not just what happened afterwards, not just the AMA, but a whole lot of things. So this is the story of Craig Watts and Leah Garces. First, a word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is the world's leading provider of audiobooks with over 150,000 titles to choose from. They have everything from my book without the permission to the Odyssey read by Ian McKellen. That's right, you can hear the Odyssey as read by Magneto. That is every bit as awesome as you think it might be. It's definitely worth checking out. And you can try right now. Get a free audiobook just by going to audible.com slash upload. Free audiobook and a 30-day free trial. All just for you at audible.com slash U-P-V-O-T-E-D. This episode is also brought to you by MeUndies. MeUndies makes really comfortable clothing that looks as great as it feels. They create high-quality men's boxer briefs, pajamas, women's briefs, lace thongs, sweatpants, and more. There is nothing better than the feeling of a fresh pair of armor. It's true. Go to MeUndies.com slash upvoted. You can receive free shipping and 20% off your first order. 
That's MeUndies.com slash U-P-V-O-T-E-D. My name is Craig Watts. I'm a contract poultry producer with Purdue Farms. I live in southeastern North Carolina. I collaborated with Compassion and World Farming and Leah Garces on a video that was released in December. I've been on this farm basically my whole life. My kids are at least the fifth generation on this part of the farm, and then the other half of the farm on my mother's side of the family. We actually have a land grant from the King of England, so we've been around here a while. Like many generations before him, Craig helped out on the farm as a kid. When he got older, he went to college and spent a few years out of state working for an agricultural research company. Uh, we were doing a lot of traveling. I got a chance to do some of that work back in North Carolina, and I actually got a chance to come back and do some of it on our farm and uh, just kind of got the bug to stay. That's why I got into the business. In 1992, Craig bought the farm from his parents and, like most farmers, he took out some sizable loans to cover the cost of the necessary updates and maintenance. He ended up amassing a considerable amount of debt and Craig needed to start looking for solutions. If I went with conventional operation, it was just not doable. The startup cost would have been tremendous. The farm economy just wasn't that good where the poultry companies came in, you know, they were offering some security with a contract, you know, positive cash flow from day one, and I just looked at it as a lifeline, you know, to stay. You agree to basically provide equipment, housing, you know, the husbandry, uh, you know, keep the houses up to standards. They agree to bring you the birds, supply you with a feed, supposedly technical support. Uh, which is debatable, but um, it's um, it's really a, a, a one-sided deal. But it, it's just it's, it's not a contract in the sense of you think you know mutual obligation. It's it's more of a, a contract of, of adhesion. But the way it works is you agree to do everything they tell you to do. Basically, I raise the bird on the farm. It might be five weeks, six weeks, whatever. They actually bring a crew in and physically remove the birds from the barn. Uh, and they put them on a truck, a truck crosses a scale, and I get paid for a lot of weight. That's, that's how I get paid. Here's how it works. Craig maintains his farm according to the poultry company's regulations on the dock. They regulate everything from the feed to the size of the living areas where the chickens are housed. In exchange, Craig gets a new flock of chicks every few weeks provided by the company's hatchery. Then they pick up the chickens, weigh them at a different location, and Craig gets paid per pound. The company Craig works with is called Purdue. You've probably heard of it in the U.S. They're the country's third largest supplier of broilers, also known as the chicken sold in grocery stores. In 2011, Purdue reported processing 640 million chickens at approximately 2,100 farms just like Craig's. That breaks down to a little over 300,000 chickens per farm per year. Craig's operation is actually bigger than average. He personally raises about 720,000 chickens each year. That's 120,000 chickens per flock, cramped into Craig's four barns every six weeks. And we do mean cramped. With chicken factory farms, it isn't unusual to have a mortality rate of 3.3%. So in a flock of 120,000 chickens, about 4,000 of them will die before reaching slaughter age just from the living conditions. And over $6 billion in annual sales, Purdue is not playing around with this big business. Even as demand for chicken soars, Craig isn't seeing much of that money. He makes the industry standard, which is about five cents per pound. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, wholesale broilers' prices are at an all-time high, averaging one dollar and four cents per pound. And as we all know, the price per pound jumps significantly for natural, cage-free, humanely raised meat like Purdue's. Here's a video with Purdue Chairman Jim Purdue on the matter. Today, the consumer is just more interested in knowing how the chickens are raised, what they've been eating, before it gets to their table. Doing the right thing is things like treating the chickens humanely, doing the right thing is uh, raising them cage free, it's the nutrition, it's all veggie diets, it's really corn, soybeans, and marigolds. It's the combination of all of those things that result in a better tasting product. And no matter what the regulations are that come out, won't make any difference because we're doing the right thing and we're transparent. Craig would disagree. And it was this total lack of transparency that he took issue with, both as a farmer and a consumer. When you see terms like cage-free, um, there's no meat bird in America grown in a cage. Never has been. So it's meaningless. 
it's just basically advertising what they've done all the time. But it makes you in your mind think, oh, okay, you know, these birds are out roaming and stuff. Um, golly, uh, then they have on there no st steroids or hormones. That was banned in the 50s. So that's not, that's, that's something, you know, much ado about nothing. Uh, then they had one on there not long ago, it was humanely raised, which HSUS actually got them to remove that from the label. Craig has worked with Purdue for over 20 years. He, of all people, knows exactly how the chickens are raised. And he's wanted to do something about it for a while, but he wasn't sure exactly what. I was very vocal, you know, in print stuff and uh, went to some uh, briefings in D.C., met with so many senators and congressmen, I, I looked and began to count them, um, op-eds, you name it. And I found out uh, just kind of by accident how powerful video was with, when, when you actually film something inside a house. And it was an issue that I had with their people, and I had uh, some very, very high mortality with some chicks because of the way they were, they were delivered. And instead of coming out and being concerned about the chicks, they were more concerned about that video getting out. So I was like, uh-huh. And so for the last five or six years, I've been collecting that kind of stuff. So just stuff on my farm. Didn't really know what to do with it. That's when Craig contacted Leah Garces. My name is Leah Garces. I'm an animal welfare activist and work for Compassionate World Farming. I collaborated with Craig Watts to produce a video that exposed the conditions that chickens are raised on Purdue farms. We met through a mutual colleague. Uh, I was working with somebody, and then they knew Leah, and they decided that you know it would might be good for us to, to speak. Uh, my, my guess is they were hearing the same story from me and her, just kind of at a different angle. And so I don't know if I called Leah or she called me, and we talked three or four times, and her and uh, the lady that does the filming for her came down, and I think y'all filmed that first day you came, didn't you, Leah? <laughs> we did. I wasn't going to miss a chance because... Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, yeah, so she, she has used me to the bone. <laughs> the reason why it was so extraordinary is we... You know, when I first started contacting you, which was a year ago, it was in the midst of all these ag gag laws that were emerging, you know, and proposals in different states. And North Carolina was one of them that was putting together an ag gag proposal, which is basically making it illegal to film inside a factory farm. And here was a farmer saying to me, and he knew exactly why I wanted to go in there, like, yeah, bring a camera. Come show the world what's actually going on. You know, he had nothing to gain from that and everything to lose. And yet he did it anyway. So, of course, naturally, I was very suspicious and worried that uh, the, the, the joke that, you know, Craig and I always talk about was the first time I drove down there with Reagan Hodge, who's a filmmaker, I did not know what to expect. I absolutely, in my head, thought that it's very likely there's going to be a group of, like, factory farmers with pitchforks ready. It was an ambush. Like, they were going to, that was it, you know. Why would somebody like Craig invite an animal activist to come down and film inside a chicken factory farm when the rest of the country is trying to keep us out? It was, uh, it was definitely out of the ordinary. Over the next few months, Leah and her crew made, Leah and her crew made several visits to Craig's farm to gather more footage. Finally, in December of 2014, Leah and her organization, Compassion and World Farming, released the video to the public. Craig has no control over the health or genetics of the chicks that are delivered to him by Purdue. Bound by contract, Craig is not even allowed to give them sunshine or fresh air. Just 37 days later, they are a sea of panting birds. Panting indicates birds are overheated. These birds find it too painful to bear the weight of their unnaturally large breasts on their legs and spend the majority of their time squatting. Their heart and lungs are also physiologically taxed, overburdened by servicing their disproportionately large chests. There is nothing natural or humane about this city. As a result of growing so big so quickly, these baby birds, only weeks old, spend much of their time sitting on the litter. Many suffer from lameness, limping, and other leg problems. 
And let me pause a moment to explain what's happening on screen. Picture dozens of cute, fluffy yellow chicks, just like the kind you'd see on drugstore Easter cards. Except then you look closer. Many of them have one kind of deformity or another, and some can't even properly open their eyes. Others have trouble walking, or just simply have trouble doing anything, really anything that a normal, healthy animal should be able to do. It's horrible to see, and it gets worse. Because in an attempt to maximize profits, the chicks grow unnaturally crooked. They've been bred to have oversized breasts, which are too big for their tiny legs to support. They can barely move fast enough to get water. As a result, they spend much of their short lives stuck in what's called a litter, also known as the sawdust mixture that covers the barn's floor. It's rarely replaced, and thus it contains the chicken's own waste, as well as a stinging ammonia agent, which is theoretically going to help sanitize. The litter irritates their skin, so they lose their feathers and develop raw red patches of bed sores. This is considered humane. The video will be linked in the episode show notes and is definitely worth checking out. I, I can describe it to you here, but you really won't understand how bad it is until you see it with your own eyes. After a word from our sponsors, we'll discuss Craig's relationship with Purdue ever since the video came out. We'll talk about the labels on chickens and Craig's favorite dinosaur. This episode is brought to you by Me Undies. As I mentioned earlier, Me Undies makes really comfortable clothing that looks as great as it feels. But you don't have to take an hour for it. This is what a Redditor named Fallon Krios said in the Jake and Amir subreddit. Me Undies is hashtag dope. I bought five pairs with the 20% a few weeks ago, and I never plan on going back to that peasant shit hands. They are unbelievably comfortable, and they wear very well. I find that they fit pretty well to scale. I'm a little on the plus side, I find them to be very comfortable. Toda, Valid Krios. Lucky for you, we got you covered over at Upland with discounts for days. For free shipping and 20% off your first order, go to meundies.com slash Upland. That's meundies.com slash U-P-V-O-T-E-D. Now, back to the story of Craig Watts and Leah Garson. The reality is, people have known for a long time about how bad industrial agriculture can be. That's precisely why they care about how their food is labeled. They're, they're trying to buy better meat. People are even willing to pay more for it, sometimes lots more. In terms of animal welfare, Leah and Craig's video probably wasn't showing the world something we haven't seen before. We're all really honest with ourselves, and we probably can't be that surprised at this point. But it, it does uncover the ways that marketers use subjective or even misleading language to manipulate consumers. I mean, if you go back to the early 80s, there were certainly people, 90s, there were certainly people. Uh, Karen Morrison in Food Inc., she kicked the damn door open. So I'm kind of just walking through a door that she kicked open. Craig and I are always joking that the next thing that we're going to do is produce a label that says chicken with two legs. Because basically the cage-free, every chicken in America that's raised from meat is raised cage-free. So they're just writing what's normal in the practice of industrial agriculture. And then people read it and they think, cage free. And then they see the package next to it and it says nothing about that. So they assume that the one next to it must be in cages. So they're preying on people's lack of knowledge about how farm animals are raised today. And so, you know, you could, you could just put like chicken with a beak, chicken with two legs. And if it's not on the label next to it, you might think, well, maybe that chicken doesn't have two legs. Maybe that chicken doesn't have a beak. And that's basically what they're doing. At the moment, it is very hard to find um, higher welfare chicken anywhere. There's a few places you can ask at your local farmer's market, and you can also act. One of the places you're guaranteed to get it is Whole Foods. Whole Foods, you go there, and they have a certification system called Global Animal Partnership. And they're going in, and they're auditing. And they have a, it has a, it's a stepped program, so it's one through five. One is the lowest on the welfare, and five is the highest. So four and five are, means they're raised in pasture. And it says on the label, pasture center, pasture raised. And three just means free range, and two is indoor, and one is the lowest. So it's very difficult to find, but you have to look for animal welfare certifications, like Certified Humane or GAP, Global Animal Partnership, or Animal Welfare Approved. And you have to look online, and you have to find those. You can also look online 
to specific farms, like white oak pastures, you can order pasture-raised animals online and have it delivered to your doorstep. So there's different ways, and you have to work hard as a consumer to find you know, animals that are raised on pasture to higher welfare standards. It's hard work, and the industry tries to keep it that way. Leah says that on a scale from one to five, Craig's farm is less than a one. But she also understands that it's not his fault. These are conditions dictated by his employer. The potential on Craig's farm is very low. So even under the best management, under the, the very best effort that Craig is making, the potential for good welfare is always going to be low because he's limited by the system that he's having to raise them in. It's an indoor system. It's basically no, it is no windows. It's 30,000 birds that have two, two thirds of a square foot each. And they're raised under using these genetics, these genetics where they are bred to suffer. They can't walk properly. Under the best circumstances, those birds are still gonna suffer. So the potential is extremely low. Where in a pasture raised system, the potential is very high. If you're using slow growing genetics and you're using you know, outdoor system and where the animals are living an enriched life and they're being able to express their natural behavior, chickens can be chickens. And so even if the, the farmer wasn't a great farmer, the potential is still going to be higher. So unfortunately, Craig is off the scale, you know, because he's, he's doing the best he can, but the circumstances that he's trapped in means he can never do better than a certain level. Remember, Craig's farm doesn't just meet producer requirements, it exceeds them. Furthermore, he can't make any other significant changes without the risk of losing his contract. There's a clause in there that says they can cancel it at any time for any reason. I must have missed that when I read it, but we, there was a time you couldn't even show that contract to a third party. That means lawyer, banker, accountant. If my wife wouldn't have signed off on it, I couldn't have shown it to her. Now, that's been done away with since, but that's what this thing is about. These guys are about controlling every aspect of the industry and even though they don't own my farm and they don't own my houses they control how it's done they have all the rights but they don't have any of the responsibilities of caring for that animal 24 7. to make matters worse if purdue ends their contract craig can't repay his debt he'll lose the farm that's been in his family for hundreds of years the the debt that he's forced into you know unknowingly you sign this contract you're told that you're going to be a business owner and you have to, of course, borrow money to be a business owner, but then you find out that the only way to ever pay your debt off is you have to keep growing chickens forever, basically. And you can only be contracted by one company because in your rural area, there's only one company that has a monopoly on that county. So what you know, you're stuck forever until you pay off that debt. And that debt is four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. And I, you know, began to understand like the way to make money, you know, the only way you're going to pay that debt off or even make ends meet is you have to raise them in these conditions because you'll lose your contract. So if you don't keep them enclosed, if they say get rid of the curtains and get rid of the windows, you know, pack more in, feed them this antibiotics or these are the genetics you're going to get, you have to do it or you lose that contract and then you can't pay your debt off and your debt is usually against your house and your property. And so if you don't basically raise chickens the way that the company wants you to, you can lose your home, you can lose your land. There's still a handful of us today that will speak out, but it's the leverage of debt. It's an effective silencer. I mean, do you, do you step out and complain about a contract that can be yanked at any time and it's going to put you directly with the very uh, likely scenario of you losing everything you've got, everything you've worked for? I mean, this farm's four or five hundred years old and I just gave it away uh, you know it's uh, it's 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 a um, it's a catch-22 you know it's wrong we know we grew up on a tobacco farm we knew that that product was killing people but we grew it anyway because the only thing we could make money on so it's, it, it puts you in a kind of a dilemma and uh, th this thing is uh, uh, is very, the, 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 they have captured every asset you own you either go along with it or you give it up. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable for the future of our food. It's not sustainable for our environment. I mean, we'll run out of food. We'll run out of arable land to grow all the maize and all the soy that's needed to feed all the factory farm animals if we keep going like this. It's not feasible. 
And people are beginning to realize that and beginning to look for higher quality all around, you know, higher quality nutritionally, higher quality for the environment, higher quality for the animals, higher quality for the farmers. There's, there's no getting around the fact that this doesn't work. We would never choose this system if we were starting all over again and we looked at how much arable land we have, how many people are on the planet. We would never say, everybody needs cheap meat. That's, what, that's the solution. Yes, that must be the solution. We'd never choose that. Instead, we'd say, okay, let's take a cold, hard look at this. We need a sustainable food model. We need, if we're going to eat meat, it has to be the solution. We'd never choose that. Instead, we'd say, okay, let's take a cold, hard look at this. We need a sustainable food model. We need, if we're going to eat meat, it has to be high quality nutritionally, which factory farm chicken isn't. And we need farming that provides jobs that are good for farmers and good for animals and good for people. It amazes me to think of just how broken this system has to be in order to bring together two people as different as Leah and Craig. Leah's a vegan who's dedicated her entire life, her entire career, to animal welfare. You know, Craig and I talked about how the media, you know, the way it's pitched, the way the industry does it, is that we're kept apart. Like, farmer and, you know, farmer, chicken farmer and animal advocate are kept apart. We're kept as enemies in the media. You know, we're trying to get in and ruin their lives, and farmers don't like us, and, you know, we're just eco-terrorists. That's what Craig lovingly calls me. And, you know, there's no, normally we wouldn't come together. Going back to the animal welfare, and, and I've learned some of this, really, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't very well versed in it. I just knew, I knew it was wrong, right? That's what I knew. But, um, you know, an animal, if, even if you're not a vegan, even if you're not a vegan, if you've got a uh, beef can be eater, you should respect that animal enough to give it at least the best life you can give it until the point where it becomes food. It, it makes no sense to me to do it any other way. And, you know, I'm the same. Like, I didn't know much about the way farmers were treated until I met you. So, you know, it's really transformed even how I think about solving this problem. And, you know, we, as we said, like, we realize, even though we're kind of pitted against each other in the public, we realize we have way more in common than we know. And we both hate the system equally. You know, if you're serious about change, what would that be? You know, politics, um, factory farming, whatever, you're going to have to get out of the box. To, to make real change or you're just going to stay in the box and nothing and it'll be just you know the future will be the same as the past and and Craig's an extraordinary person he's very brave and he's very smart and he's kept excellent records he's totally clean you know that doesn't come around very often and I think we're equally you know determined to change this industry and so my expectation you know when we started off was not very much, and my expectation now is we're going to turn this industry upside down. We're going to sort it out. As of now, Craig hasn't actually lost his contract with Purdue. He thinks it's because it would give them even more bad publicity. But he says there have been other selling repercussions. They put me on some kind of performance improvement plan. I call it house arrest. No biggie. Uh, you know, just more annoying than anything because they can be done silently. I mean, I don't know that the, the weights that they use on my birds are accurate because they're weighted Dylan. I'm at the farm. Am I getting good quality chicks or am I getting bad quality? I don't know. I don't have any control of that. So, you know, they can go with a pencil easier than they can something overt, you know, that can be put in the press. So, but but I, I can't say that they have what they had. And other than that performance improvement plan, I, I feel that it, it was retaliation. It's just because of the time. And see, what happened was the flock that Lee and I filmed was in May. They didn't get the panties in a wad until December. So I had, I had two more flocks on top of that one. They sent people down once a week. Everything was okay, good, glowing. And then the minute that video came out, I was a bad seat. Then six months later, after the video film, I'm putting on a performance improvement plan. I mean, you connect the dots. After our final break, we'll let you know some tips Frank can get involved, and I promised him Craig's favorite dinosaur, and I'll also share my final thoughts. This episode is brought to you by Harry's. Harry's is serious about their shaving products while still respecting your face and your wallet. 
Their kits come with handcrafted, high-quality German blades at a fraction of the price of big brand razors. And their starter set is a great deal. For $15, you'll get a razor, moisturizing shave cream, and three razor blades. Though, don't take my word for it. A Redditor named Zack Attack, that's Z-A-C-A-T-T-A-C, wrote this in a now fashion by subreddit. I really enjoy Harry's because I have a beard, but still keep part of my cheeks, my neck, and mustache shaved off. It's the perfect price point, so I'm not dropping $14 on four blades that last less time than Harry's do. I like the customer service, their product, and their aesthetics. So, go to harrys.com right now, and I'll give you $5 off if you type in the coupon code UPVOTED with your first purchase. So, start shaving today. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com, coupon code UPVOTED. After hearing this, you're at all inspired to help Leah and Craig fight the good fight. You can share your support right now through direct action. We have a petition which is going directly to the top supermarkets in the country asking those supermarkets to do better for chickens and for farmers and asking them to put better chicken on the shelf. And they can sign that at better-chicken.org. Yeah, we sit down three times a day to eat and each time we make a choice about our food. But in doing that, we're making a choice about the way farmers are treated, about the way animals are treated, and really about our future, our planet. And so the worst thing in the world to me would be that consumers don't think about that. They don't make a conscious choice when they eat. And, you know, we need, if change is going to happen, consumers have to demand better. They have to say, I, you know, I won't stand for this. I won't cooperate with an unjust food system. And through their food choices, they will build a better future for our world. But before we go, Craig told us during his AMA, someone asked what his favorite type of dinosaur is. Well, I said Tyrannosaurus, but then I got to thinking all these vegans, I went back to Brontosaurus because uh, <laughs> if, if I got to go to war, I'm carrying the vegans with me. I have to admit, I wasn't shocked by any of the footage that I saw. At this point, I think just about any one of us is a few clicks away from seeing some hidden camera or some documentary exposing the pretty awful conditions in most of the factory farms here in the United States. So that wasn't the surprising thing. What was really surprising to me was to see these two very different people from very different walks of life, very different causes, working together. That's that's really just how bad the situation has got. I mean, even though there is still more and more data showing that we really need to be changing the way we raise our food, not just for the sake of the animals, but also for the sake of us, those who are eating it. There's so much data, and yet it seems very little has been done, right? We're getting new labels, and marketers are coming up with new ways in order to sell us things, but aren't really being honest with us. And so this is where I hope change can happen. There have been plenty of documentaries, you know, they even referenced Food Inc. that have tried to raise awareness for this. There have been organizations fighting for this for decades. What really struck me though was that this was a video that was a few minutes long, uploaded to YouTube, that started a discussion on Reddit. They got enough people talking. It created this opportunity for a couple of people to get up on a stage, so to speak, and do one of these AMA interviews. And I hope it's going to be through little victories like this, not through big blockbuster documentaries that everyone talks about, everyone says, oh, you gotta see this. But through these little bite-sized videos, they don't require a ton of commitment, right? They don't require you to mentally say, I'm gonna take the next two hours to watch this documentary about the horrors of factory farming. There are some people who are never gonna hit that play button on their Netflix, just because that just does not appeal to them. And so, as long as you're only reaching out to that audience of people who are willing to sit through that a very pointed, you know, important documentary, you're still just going to be breaching the choir, as they say. And the nice thing about something like this, about a discussion that bubbles up across social media, about a video that you can upload to YouTube, and it takes a few minutes to get through, is that it can reach a bigger audience. It has a higher chance of injecting some of that data into someone who may not have normally sought it out. And you know what, I don't think it's gonna happen, but I would love it if one of the executives at Purdue came on Reddit and did his or her own AMA to talk about their side of this. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna lay off the chicken for a little while after watching that video. Well, but how about you? Let us know, as always, in the comments of this thread over at r slash upvoted. We'll be discussing this episode as well as every single episode of Upvoted that we ever do 
We want to hear what you think. There you will also find all of the relevant links in the show notes, as well as the original r slash videos post, their AMA, and a link to their petition. You know what? We'll even drop in a link to Craig's favorite overall store, Davis Big and Tall. Davis Big and Tall is not yet a sponsor of this podcast, but dare to dream. Maybe one day we're here for you. Uh, but you know who is? It's Squarespace. They actually sponsored a few episodes a little while back. And in the ad, we said, hey, if you've got a Squarespace website, let us know. We'll give you a shout out. A bunch of people responded. And I believe our favorite was this one from Steve. Uh, it is actually not his website. He helped set it up, though. It's for his girlfriend's father. Now, that gentleman is a master Japanese woodworker, and he has some amazing pieces on his website. He doesn't use any sandpaper whatsoever. I'm told that everything he makes, all that furniture, is made purely with the kana, which is a Japanese carpenter's plant. I did not know that. It was just explained to me. Uh, and the, these tools, they're also made in the traditional Japanese style. It's, it's very cool. Um, check out the website. It's tokunagafurniture.com. It's spelled T-O-K-U-N-A-G-A furniture.com. Also, I need to thank Unbabble for, once again, providing transcription and translation services for this show, as well as every episode of Upvoted by Reddit. Transcripts can be found in English and in Espanol under the relevant links heading for every episode or in the wiki of r slash upvoted. So take a look. Let us know what you think. And as always, keep that feedback coming. We have blown past half a million downloads because you all are amazing. And you keep spreading the word about this show. It has been an absolute delight making it with all of you. I can't believe we're already a quarter of the way in. Well, a quarter of the way into the year. Anyway, uh, you all have made this possible. It reminds me so much of the very early days of Reddit. It's so collaborative. It's been so great getting all this feedback. And I hope you will join us again next week when we do this again on Upvoted by Reddit.